Yes, this weekend I'm visiting a real good friend of mine. She lives on a planet orbiting Alpha Centauri, a star distant from Earth by about 4.5 light years. So, to visit her, I will have to embark on a super fast spaceship that can travel at an average speed of 99.9% .9 the speed of light. Do not worry, I'll be back in about nine years. But I will only have aged by about five months. How is this possible? Well, it's time for us to dive into a fascinating consequence of special relativity, time dilation. Did you notice that this video is the hundredth video of the channel? And did you notice that the Physics Made Easy community has reached 40,000 subscribers this month? It's incredible! And this wouldn't have been possible without your encouragements and support. Everyone, I love you. Thank you so much. Some of you have asked to me in the comments to discuss special relativity. But to be honest, I don't think it is possible to do so in a 10 or 20 minute video when starting from scratch and without cutting too many corners, you know? But if we focus on one specific consequence of special relativity, it might be enough to give you a little taste of how space and time are so intimately intertwined. Before we can dive deep into relativistic weirdness, there is one abstract concept that is crucial to understand first. What is an inertial frame of reference? Once I am done explaining this, I'll present the two postulates at the origin of special relativity. These two postulates have truly bizarre consequences on our conception of space and time. This video focuses on the most known of these consequences, time dilation, where the faster a clock moves relatively to an observer, the slower the clock appears to tick for that observer. On our way, we will derive the relativistic factor gamma and define a very useful concept, the notion of proper time interval. A frame of reference is a set of scaled axes which intersect. The intersection is called the point of origin. Each axis represents a dimension that can be either space or time. A frame of reference assigns coordinates to an object or an event. For example, I know where this apple is because it has coordinates within a frame of reference based on two spatial axes. The coordinates of the apple here are plus 3 meters horizontally and plus 2 meters vertically. Here is another one with one spatial axis and one time axis. Within this frame of reference, there is a light that flashes once. By reading the diagram, I know that the flashing event is located 4 meters to the right and occurs at a time equal to 3 seconds and this for a duration of 2 seconds. When you look at the world around you, your brain considers itself at the point of origin of a three-dimensional spatial frame of reference and organizes this information into a sequence along a fourth axis, which is time. The point of origin of that frame of reference is you, and this whether you are remaining still or moving. This frame of reference is your point of view on the world. So whatever object or event you observe, you do so within that frame of reference. Now it's time for me to present Alice and Bob. Alice is standing on a train platform. She's remaining still. Bob is a passenger of a train traveling at a constant velocity v to the right. The frame of reference of Alice is centered on her and the frame of reference of Bob is centered on him. When Alice looks at Bob passing by, she sees Bob moving with his frame of reference. Because Bob's frame of reference is moving at a constant velocity, it is said to be an inertial frame of reference. An inertial frame of reference is a frame of reference moving at a constant velocity. And this definition includes also frames with a velocity of zero. It means that even if you are standing still, your own frame of reference is also inertial. It is important to realize that a frame of reference is not inertial when it accelerates. For example, consider an object like this pen. I'm holding the pen, so its velocity is zero, therefore constant, so the frame of the pen is inertial. Now, if I drop the pen, it falls under the influence of gravity, so it accelerates. 
and so will its frame of reference. In that case, the frame of reference of the pen is not inertial. For special relativity to be applicable, all frames that are considered need to be inertial. OK, that said, we can get into the meat now. Special relativity, published by Albert Einstein in 1905, is entirely based on two fundamental postulates. The first postulate states that the laws of Newton remain valid in all inertial frames of reference. To understand what this means, let's pay a visit to Alice. Alice has a ball in her hand. She drops it. Naturally, the ball falls vertically. The reason it does this is that there is a non-zero vertical net force on the ball, accelerating the ball downwards. This net force is equal to the sum of the gravitational force and Eviston's force acting on the ball. That's the second law of Newton. On the other hand, the ball does not move sideways. Sideways, it has a velocity of zero. Therefore, the net force sideways is zero. That's the first law of Newton. Now, let's pay a visit to Bob. He is in a train that is moving at constant velocity. In his hand, he has a ball too, and drops it. In his perspective, the ball falls to the ground vertically, in the same way and for the same reasons that Alice's ball did. So you see, even if Bob's frame of reference has a velocity, the laws of Newton still apply within it. It is said that the laws of Newton are invariant across inertial frames of reference. Note that if the train was accelerating, what would Bob see? He would see the ball go shoop, sideways. So this invariance of Newton's laws is only valid within inertial frames of reference, not accelerated ones. Now this one is at the heart of the whole story. The second postulate states that an observer measuring the speed of light will always obtain the same value, whatever inertial frame of reference he is at rest in. That means that whether you are moving or not relatively to the source of light, the light coming out of it will always have the same speed. That is exactly 299,792,458 meters per second. Of course, in this video, we round this value to 300 million meters per second. That statement is predicted theoretically by Maxwell's laws on electromagnetism and has been proven experimentally multiple times. But what does this invariance of the speed of light really imply? Let's check this out with Alice and Bob. Maybe they have an answer to that question. Alice is standing still on the train platform. Bob is on a train moving towards the right at a constant speed. Bob takes out a flashlight and points it to his right. He measures the speed of a particle of light, a photon, coming out of his flashlight and finds out that the photon is traveling at a speed of 300 million meters per second. Alice is observing Bob doing this measurement and she is curious. She also measures the speed of the photon coming out of Bob's flashlight. Intuitively, you might think that the result of her measurement would be equal to the sum of the speed of the photon as measured by Bob and the speed of the train. So Alice's measurement of the speed of the photon would be a speed larger than 300 million meters per second. Yet, Alice gets exactly the same result as Bob. Bob and Alice are respectively at rest in different inertial frames of reference. Yet, they do measure the same value for the speed of light. There appears to be a bug in the matrix here. Well, there is a way out of this. We need to become a little flexible with how we see time. Time in a moving object needs to flow slower when measured by an observer at rest. This phenomena is called time dilation. The challenge I gave myself with this video is to prove this to you using a level of mathematics that does not go beyond grade 10. Again, to do that, I will need the assistance of our good friends Alice and Bob. Alice is standing still on the station's platform, and Bob is on the train moving to the right at a velocity v relatively to Alice. Bob has a special device with him, a photon clock. A photon clock consists of two mirrors separated by a known distance h. In between the mirrors bounces back and forth a photon. The photon is the particle of light so it travels at the speed of light. One tick of the clock corresponds to the time it takes for the photon to bounce back and forth between the mirrors once. Alice and Bob are both observing that clock. What does Bob see? Well, Bob sees the photon bouncing vertically between the mirrors. So the time measured by Bob for a tick, delta TB, where B stands for Bob, is twice the distance between the mirrors divided by the speed of light. 
Alice too sees the photon bouncing between the mirrors. But in her perspective, the clock is in the train and therefore is moving sideways with the train. And so is the photon. For Alice, during the time the photon goes from the first mirror to the second and then back to the first, it will have moved to the right at a velocity v. So you see, the distance travelled by the photon within a tick will appear larger for Alice than it appears for Bob. But remember the second postulate. The speed of light is constant in both Alice's and Bob's frames of reference. Something has to give here, and what gives is time. The duration of a tick for Alice, that we will call delta T A, A stands for Alice, must be larger than the duration of a tick for Bob. Let's calculate by how much. that, we will need to visualize the path of the photon between mirrors during a tick of the clock as seen by Alice. The vertical distance covered by the photon is the same as for Bob, twice the distance between the mirrors, that is 2h. But because Alice sees the clock moving sideways at a velocity v, there is also a horizontal distance covered by the photon during one tick. That distance is v multiplied by delta t a. The total distance covered by a photon during one tick of the clock, as seen by Alice, is twice the hypotenuse of the right angle triangle of height h and base v delta t a over 2. So let's apply Pythagore. The speed of light being the same in all inertial frames of reference, the distance d covered in a time interval delta t a over 2 would therefore be c multiplied by delta t a over 2. We already have seen that in Bob's perspective, the distance covered by the photon in a half a tick is h, which is c multiplied by delta t b over 2. Now, let's replace d and h in the Pythagorean equation by the expressions we found for d and h. Because the denominators are identical in all terms, we can get rid of them. And as a next step, we can factorize out both time intervals. Let's make the duration of a tick in Alice's perspective the subject. Then, let's divide numerator and denominator by c squared. And finally, take the square root on both sides. We get this. And here appears a factor. A factor equal to the square root of the inverse of 1 minus v squared over c squared. This factor is central to the theory of special relativity. It is called the relativistic factor sometimes nicknamed the gamma factor. So in the end, we obtain a very simple formula, the time dilation formula, delta T A equals gamma delta T B, where delta T B is the duration of a clock tick measured by Bob, delta T A is the duration of a clock tick measured by Alice, and gamma is the relativistic factor. The time dilation formula. Here it is in all of its splendor. Delta T equals gamma delta T P. I changed the indices of the time intervals because we do not need Alice and Bob anymore. Delta T P is the interval of time between two events measured within a frame where both events are at the same position. Such an interval of time is called the proper time interval. The little p in delta T P stands for proper. For example, a rocket flies from Earth to Mars. The two events are the departure from Earth and the arrival on Mars. A clock on Earth and a clock on the rocket measure the time interval between these two events, i.e. the duration of the trip. The proper time interval will be the time interval measured by the clock on the rocket, because the two events happen at the same position within the rocket's frame of reference. In our previous example with the photon clock, it is the duration of a tick measured by Bob which is the proper time interval because the clock remains at rest in Bob's frame of reference. Yeah, at the beginning of the tick and at the end of the tick, the clock is still at the same position relatively to Bob. In the time dilation formula, delta t is the interval of time between the two events as measured from a natural inertial frame of reference. With the example of the rocket, it will be the time interval measured by the clock on Earth. The two events, departure and arrival of the rocket, happen at different positions within this frame. In the example with the photon clock, delta t is the duration of a tick as measured by Alice, because for Alice, 
the end and the beginning of a tick happen at different positions within her frame of reference. Yes, the clock is moving relatively to Alice. And finally, if you look at the time dilation formula carefully, you will note that the time interval delta t will always be longer than the proper time interval delta tp, because gamma, the relativistic factor, is always larger than 1. That's why we call this phenomena time dilation. Let's illustrate this. Imagine two best friends, Bob and Alice. Them again. They met when they were just kids. Today, both are 30 years old. Bob decides to leave Earth and travel to Merak, a star about 80 light years away. For this, Bob embarks on a spaceship that travels at an average velocity of 99% of the speed of light. How old will Alice and Bob be when Bob arrives at his destination? The two events to consider are the departure from Earth and the arrival around Merak. Bob has a clock on board and measures the time it takes for him to arrive to that star. Because departure and arrival are at the same position within Bob's frame of reference, the duration recorded by that clock will be the proper time interval. Therefore, Alice, who remained on Earth, will measure a longer time interval than Bob. In Alice's perspective, Bob is traveling at 99% of the speed of light, so every year Bob covers 0.99 light years. It will take him 80 divided by 0.99, that is about 81 years to get at destination. By the time Bob arrives, Alice will be pretty old, 111 years old. What about Bob? How old will he be? First, let's calculate the relativistic factor. We find a value of 7.1. Then, Let's plug in numbers in the time dilation formula to determine the proper time interval. 81 divided by 7.1 is 11.4 years. So, in Bob's perspective, the trip took only 11 years. You want to give it a try? Here's another question. The Starshot program plans on sending mini probes towards the closest star at a speed of 20% of the speed of light. Imagine that one of these probes is programmed to send a report towards Earth every 24 hours. For the engineers of the Space Center on Earth, how much time will pass between two reports? Freeze the video and give it a shot. In this video, we looked at some important concepts related to Einstein's special relativity. Inertial frames of reference, the two postulates, the time dilation effect, the relativistic factor, and the proper time interval. But, to be honest, we barely scratched the surface. A more extensive approach would have been to present Lorentzian transformations from which many relativistic consequences can be derived, including the one we discussed in this video. So you see, we really just got a tiny glimpse on the subject. So I encourage you to dig further, because it is a really fascinating view of the universe that awaits you. Et voilà! I hope this video inspires you in exploring further this fascinating theory that is special relativity. But now it's time for me to rest a little, and for you to like, comment, subscribe, and smash this notification bell. Doing so really encourages me in making new video and helps the channel. In the meantime, I wish you the best and I'll see you soon for the next episode of Physics Made Easy. Ciao!